Hello and welcome to The Debrief Live. I'm Angus Scott. Now, we thought for a change, we'd throw everything open to you this week. There's so much going on at uh, so many clubs that it would be hard to just keep everything down to one topic. So this is The Debrief Mailbag. So we've lined up some know-it-alls for you, and I mean that obviously in the nicest possible way. Uh, we'll be hearing from Fabrizio Romano in about 10 minutes or so. There's nothing he doesn't know about the transfer market. As ever, Ben Jacobs has been delving through his black book, which is smaller than his wallet, to find some answers to the questions that you are about to pose. Ben, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My wallet is giant, so my black book is still healthy. And I'm pretty sure you just called Fabrizio Romano a know-it-all to kick off the show. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, that's that's one of the nicest things uh, anyone is ever called because he does know it all. Uh, I'm also delighted to say that uh, Jonathan Johnson, CBS Sports correspondent, is with us too. JJ, welcome back to the debrief. Hey there, guys. Thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, looking forward to it. Okay. Well, your questions out there are welcome. In fact, they're vital, or we're not going to be here for very long. So please do get in touch via the comments section below. We'll get through as many of your questions as we can. Uh, ben, I want to throw to you first about the latest on Manchester United. Now, we had a, the pod was on United last week. Uh, we were saying that Thursday was the big day. There was a big more, uh, board meeting. Uh, what happened? Well, the board meeting was scheduled, so it went ahead as planned, but the deal, because of the New York Stock Exchange and various rules, logistics, legalities, means that no approval or vote can be done unless it's 100%. So this isn't like a transfer where you can all but confirm it, and then the medical takes place afterwards. Everything has to be complete, then it can be put to the board, then it can be announced to investors. And then, obviously, Manchester United can make a formal announcement. So there was nothing in the end voted on at the board meeting. That was a possibility, but it was never definite. But there's still a feeling that it's a case of when, not if, with Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Manchester United. And seemingly, what sources indicate is in the next few weeks, everything should be pushed through. After that, there's, of course, some other box ticks like the Premier League owners and directors test and various other things that need to take place. The transfer of funds, of course, all of these can add a little bit of time. But Jim Ratcliffe is looking to try and get in and have his sporting control in order to, let's say, influence the January window, even though Manchester United are not necessarily thinking about anything too big then. And then he'll have a transitional period where he can review the club with a view to being stronger in terms of any type of data day control over the summer, which is why it's obviously important that it gets done quickly and Manchester United get Champions League football, because that will also help financially Manchester United get themselves in a position where they can do a little bit more. But I think the headline news is that Sheikh Jassim is out. That's 100%. And Ratcliffe does look like he's coming in and it will be sooner rather than later. So, JJ, if you can put your your French hat on or your chapeau, I should probably say. Um, look, uh, Sir Jim has his association and his his ownership of, of part of Nice. Uh, what does that therefore mean for Manchester United? What what can they expect if this deal finally goes through? Well, there's a lot of different things that, the, that they can expect. I think in sort of an immediate sense. Uh, you know, we will see, uh, you know, Ratcliffe probably try to bring some of the best elements of the, the Ineos setup that, that he's got in place at Nice, uh, you know, because he has, uh, you know, brought in some new faces uh, in recent months. Obviously, we know that um, Brailsford is, uh, is involved uh, in the hierarchy, but you've also got uh, sort of former PSG and Juventus uh, bigwig uh, Jean-Claude Blanc, who... You know, I think would be a good fit for, you know, an elite club like Manchester United, or at least historically speaking, an elite club like United. Um, and, you know, I also think that it will get really interesting if Nice managed to maintain their current form, uh, you know, the only unbeaten side in Ligue 1 uh, still remaining and looking good to qualify for European competition now with sort of you know, our, our sort of knowledge that that Jim Radcliffe at some point in the near future would probably have a pathway to a majority ownership that makes Nice's status extremely interesting, especially when you look at what happened between Milan and Toulouse, uh, you know, who were both uh, under Redbird ownership uh, coming into Europe this season. 
it would probably mean some significant changes for Nice sort of beyond the end of this campaign. That's assuming that they do qualify for Europe. I think if they were to fall short again, obviously that would be massively disappointing for the Nice supporters. Uh, but, uh, you know, it might sort of prolong potentially, uh, you know, Ratcliffe and Ineos' uh, involvement in uh, in Nice. But that's sort of the obvious thing to, to sort of put on the radar as, uh, you know, a potential sort of complication. But, uh, you know, some of the names that have sort of been put out there so far that Ratcliffe could look to, to potentially bring in and be involved from the very beginning at United have included Paul Mitchell, who we know has left Monaco. Uh, you know, there wasn't really any possibility of Mitchell making the move from Monaco to Nice uh, because of their rivalry, but also sort of because of the the plans that, that had been put in place uh, with Ratcliffe's interest in, uh, in United. Uh, and I think potentially, you know, maybe the biggest threat uh, to Ratcliffe, Ineos and, and their project with Nice uh, in the short term will probably be the fan resistance and the frustration that will come out. Because let's not forget, this isn't the first uh, sort of flirtation with a Premier League club and a, a significant stake in a Premier League club. You had Chelsea before, you had Liverpool, and now you've got United. While it might uh, sort of be more understandable because of uh, Ratcliffe's, uh, you know, childhood fan history, uh, you know, with United, uh, I think Nice supporter patience has worn very thin uh, because of sort of those previous uh, dalliances. And now, uh, you know, the the interesting situation will be to to see sort of what happens with Nice sort of probably from the midpoint of this season to, uh, you know, next summer, uh, you know, assuming that Ratcliffe and, you know, the, the United deal, which, you know, Ben alluded to, is likely to get over the line sooner rather than later. You, you mentioned Paul Mitchell there. Um, what sort of an impact did he have at Monaco? Because he is clearly the, the name that's in the frame to be uh, sporting director at, at Old Trafford should uh, Sir Jim get the sort of a quarter of the keys to the door. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, he's done, I would say, quite an underrated job in many ways because he inherited a very messy situation, an extremely bloated squad. And also when you come into that role with Monaco, you're not really just overseeing the Monaco squad. You're also overseeing the Circle Brugge squad as well because, uh, you know, they are, you know, they share the ownership. So, you know, it was a very arduous task that was laid out in front of him. There's no, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, um, Mitchell would would sort of shirk away from the fact that, you know, objectives weren't met last season. Uh, you know, there is disappointment that Monaco find themselves out of, uh, you know, continental football this season. But overall, uh, sort of compared to the situation that he inherited, he left Monaco in a reasonably, uh, you know, stronger position or at least a more organised, um, you know, manner. It was... Uh, you know, not, it didn't always go quite according to plan, uh, you know, and European qualification has sort of been up and down, but that's also kind of par for the course with Monaco, given the project that is in place and always has to be in place, uh, you know, given the nature of the club. Uh, but I do think that he showed, um, you know, his pedigree over the years, uh, you know, and you can see why, um, you know, he's being lined up for this kind of role. You look at the experience that he's had, not just with Monaco, but with the Red Bull Empire as well, uh, you know, and there was a feeling in France that he had been looking at potential ways to get back to England, back to the Premier League at some point in his future. Uh, you know, and it seems like this is the the right opportunity at the right time for the right person. OK, keep your uh, comments coming in because uh, it's all about you today. We want to hear everything, uh, all the questions that we hopefully can ans uh, answer for you. I want to move on to one straight away from uh, Ankush Anand, who says, any chance of a Kateri coming of the Kateri bid effectively coming back for Manchester United, Ben? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. And unfortunately, for those that want Qatar at Manchester United, sources on the Qatar side are adamant that they're 100% out. I know that some have asked why there's not been a public statement if they're definitely out, but there's the NDA to think of. There's Rain Group's guidelines as well. And um, as you well know, Angus, because you've lived in the region much like I did for the best part of five years, you don't always want to make that statement because suddenly you're not controlling the narrative. What Qatar wanted to do was jump before they were pushed and pull out on their own terms because then they can tell their side of the story. They can brief something that is a little bit more positive before all of the Ratcliffe headlines start emerging, before Manchester United have 
in likelihood a new minority investor. So it was very much tactical and due to the fact that Sheikh Jassim and 92 Foundation had grown fatigued by the process. And the natural question we ask our sources as journalists is, is it 100%? Is it 99.9%? Is there any gamesmanship to it? But it's very clear the Qatar position that they are 100% out. And you can look at that as 100% because they feel Ratcliffe has won. You can look at that as 100% because they got tired of the process. You can look at that as 100% because they don't believe the Glazers want to go. Or you can look at that as 100% because they were never quite what they said they were. And their valuations are not necessarily matching the PR that we've seen. And Everyone can have their own interpretation. So this isn't me necessarily saying it's one or the other. Those are the different permutations. Some close to the selling side have always been dubious of Qatar, but those on the Qatar side have been quite consistent that they were debt-free, they were double or almost the market value of the club, and they had placed investment on top. So obviously on paper, there's a lot to like about the Qatar bid. And if the Qatar number is accurate, their club valuation is not that different to Sir Jim Ratcliffe's either. So that would lend itself to a conclusion that maybe the Glazers have decided that they simply don't want to sell now and as a six because they think the value of the club will increase further down the line. There's lots of complexities to this, but regardless of why, the reality from the Qatar side is a very clear position now that they are out and they don't plan to come back in. And also, despite links with Spurs and Inter, they're not necessarily looking as 9-2 foundation to put that money that they've been unsuccessful with for Manchester United towards another club at this stage. I think that if there is investment in another club, it may come through a different medium from Qatar. But simply put, 9-2 foundation state via sources that I'm speaking to anyway, they're out and they have no plans to return. Okay, another question here from uh, Anana. How will Sir Jim Ratcliffe manage to fund the team and rebuild, improve the stadium and pay off the debt? I'm not sure for 25% of the club he's going to do all those things because um, he, he, he's just taking sporting control. But obviously the idea is that in time he takes more and more of the club and therefore the those other bits, improving the stadium and paying off some of the debt, will become his responsibility. Yeah, I think that's true. I'll get kind of JJ's thoughts on Sir Jim Ratcliffe and what Ineos have done at Nice again in a moment because we may get some clues as to plans based upon what we've seen at Nice. And JJ will also know about Ratcliffe and the wider group in terms of how they see football. And what I can tell you on that front is that Ratcliffe and his business partners are very hands-on. And a name that we've not mentioned, for example, that could play a key role at Manchester United is Jean-Claude Blanc, who's joined from PSG. And again, JJ will be able to go into that detail. But regarding how it's actually going to be funded, I think that we need to understand the structure because there's lots of different possibilities. But one option is that Sir Jim Ratcliffe ends up adding, as he always said when he wanted a majority stake and control, pledged investment on top. Because if there is a long-term path to control for Ratcliffe, then it may be in his interest to not only buy the 25%, but also add pledged investment, which is always something that Ratcliffe said he'd do. So therefore, you actually get two kinds of injection, one for the percentage and then one on top of that. And the second part could also come through an injection of equity into the club. I won't go into great detail because we're speculating still over the structure at this point, but it is one possibility that Ratcliffe might inject equity and buy 25%. So then your 25% will be a mix of likely a and B shares, some will go to the Glazers, some could well go back into the club, some could go to the other A shareholders. On top of that, he may inject equity into the club to get another 5 or 10%, taking his state to 30 or 35%. And that injection of equity would be directly pumped back into the club to fund the stadium redevelopment and other projects. But it's clear that the maths don't add up at the moment because your stadium redevelopment could be 
2 billion, certainly 1.5 billion. Then there's Carrington redevelopment. Then there's existing transfer fees that still need to be factored in and paid off. There's obviously the debt. There's new forthcoming windows too. Not everything can just be done via commercial deals of which Manchester United have done well on and outgoings in January or next summer. There needs to be some extra injection of cash and that either has to come from the Glazers, from Sir Jim Ratcliffe, or through some kind of borrowing, which is the dreaded word that Manchester United fans hate to hear. If there is borrowing by Ineos, it will be burdened on Ineos, not Manchester United, but it's still not ideal. So I think, JJ, when we look at Manchester United, there's a lot to do. Is there anything that you've seen at Nice that suggests a strategy they may adopt, whether in terms of specific things done or personnel who have been involved? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, I think the insistence on, uh, you know, having such authority on sporting matters from day one, uh, you know, would uh, suggest that very much the, the the sort of plan that was put in place for, you know, Nice's previously ambitious project, um, you know, to, to try and challenge at the top of Ligue 1, uh, you know, go toe to toe with PSG season after season, uh, you know, and ultimately try to win the French title, which has since been walked back by Nice president uh, River. You know, I think that is something that we can look at, you know, maybe being transferred over to, to Manchester United in the short term. Uh, I, I do agree with you. I think it makes absolute sense to have somebody like Jean-Claude Blanc involved. You know, you look at what he managed to achieve, uh, you know, over a decade uh, in Paris with PSG, what you know he helped to, to create in Paris. Uh, and despite some sort of mixed results on the pitch, uh, based on the expectations that were laid out by Qatari ownership, uh, you know, you'd have to say sort of his development of, of PSG as a club was an overwhelming success. He hasn't had the time, uh, you know, to, to put his methods in place yet in Nice, and it doesn't sound like he's going to get it, certainly not in terms of the initial project that, that he was signing up for. But I do think sort of one of the first things the, that they would need to address, uh, you know, once they get their foot through the door at Old Trafford would be the, the manager situation, because we know that Eric Ten Hag has been afforded, uh, you know, a big amount uh, of influence over what's going Going on on the pitch uh, at Old Trafford, and if there's any doubt, uh, you know whether that it's with uh, you know Mitchell, whether it's with Blanc, and any of these potential characters who could immediately come on board with Ratcliffe, uh, you know if there's any doubt over sort of some of the pieces that are already in place, uh, you know I think tough decisions were would have to be made because we've seen in the past since Ineos uh, you know took over at Nice when they've trusted figures who were already in place. It hasn't necessarily worked out well. You know, you look at the situation with Julien Fournier, obviously, uh, you know, you can't necessarily judge Nice's ownership based on the, the <clears> scandal <throat> that, that Christophe Galtier and Fournier were embroiled in. But the fact that Fournier was there, uh, left and then came back, uh, you know, that was perhaps a, a misjudgment on, on Ineos's part in terms of, you know, how they wanted the sporting project to be overseen. So I think they'll learn from that experience, uh, you know, and perhaps go with, you know, some of the bolder choices that, that they've been making recently. Because if you look at this Nice squad, yes, it's unbeaten near the top of Ligue 1. But in terms of what they've decided, the, the direction, uh, you know, for the club to go in, going with a fairly untested young upcoming manager like Francesco Farioli was a very bold choice, but it's one that's paying off so far. Uh, and they do still have, uh, you know, some very talented young French players in that squad, the likes of Todibo, the likes of Turam. So you can't say that it's been a complete failure for Nice uh, on the sporting side of things when you look at what's been going on on the pitch. Uh, and it's just, it, it's funny, really, the way these things work out that we're talking about, you know, Ratcliffe and Ineos potentially, uh, you know, looking to, to move operations to, to Manchester United over the medium to long term when things could finally work out in the short term, uh, you know, with the Nice project that they've been putting the pieces into place for over the last couple of years. But it is... Um, you know, something that I think would need addressing very early, sort of the, the question of whether they move forward, uh, you know, with somebody like Ten Hag at the helm, especially if Mitchell comes in, because we know that Mitchell's come from the Red Bull empire. And you look at what Monaco did over the last couple of years, there's been a very strong Red Bull influence there. So that's something that could potentially be uh, a storyline to watch, uh, you know, should Radcliffe, uh, you know, manage to get his foot through the door and start bringing some people in with him. OK, do keep your questions coming in. Thanks, JJ, for the moment. Thank you, Ben, for the moment. We want to hear from you. Uh, they are here to answer your questions. Me too, if there's anything uh, that you want asked 
uh, then do that and we'll try and get it uh, answered for you as soon as possible. But in the meantime, uh, let's head over to Fabrizio Romano, who we caught up with just a little bit earlier to get the latest uh, on the transfer dealings around the world. Fabrizio, if Sir Jim Ratcliffe does come into Manchester United, do you expect them to have a busy January transfer window? No, I don't think it's going to change a lot, honestly. Uh, I think for Manchester United, the January transfer window is going to be about opportunities in any case, with or without Sergio Ratcliffe. Uh, so I expect something similar to last year. So if they find an opportunity, like in that case was Vegorst or that kind of deal, I think my United will go for it. Otherwise, I think their their mission will be to do something important next summer to prepare the squad next summer of course it also it also depends on other factors as we always mention it's also about the recovery of lisandro martinez i think that's going to be a really important part of the story for manchester united in january they want to make sure he's under percent fit for the second part of the season and so that story of, of Lisandro is going to be crucial, uh, together with the future of Harry Maguire. Maguire is now doing well, but we have to see how it's going to be the situation at the end of December when my United will make decisions in terms of, of centre-backs. And then the story of Jadon Sancho is going to be important to understand if my United want to do something also in offensive positions or not. But in general, I don't think this is not going to have an impact in terms of spending big money or in the January window. We'll come to Jaden Sancho in a moment, but um, is Paul Mitchell the favourite to be sporting director? He's a candidate for sure. Uh, he has a great relationship with uh, with Jim Ratcliffe. Uh, he knows him very well. He knows people close to him. So for sure, he's always been appreciated by people at, at Ineos Group. And so for sure, he's a candidate. At the moment, I'm told that nothing is decided yet. So there is still no communication to Paul Mitchell or to other people uh, close to Manchester United board that he's going to be 100% the new, the new director. So for sure, he's a candidate. For sure, there are discussions. But at the moment, it's still not a guarantee that he's going to be the new, the new director. It's also important to understand what's going to happen with other people in the board at Manchester United, like John Murtaugh and all the other people taking care of the transfers of Manchester United in the recent years. So there are still many things to decide before we can say that he's going to be the new director, but he's a candidate for sure. What is the latest on uh, Jadon Sancho? It seems there's no apology upcoming, so therefore it's likely he's on his way out in January. Is, is there a sort of price that Manchester United want back on their investment in him? Look, at the moment, from Manchester United, there is still no mention of price for, for Jadon Sancho. I think they know that at the moment it's not guaranteed that it's going to be a permanent transfer. That could be a loan deal, maybe with a buy option clause included. So I think they will be open in January to any opportunity. Of course, they would favour a permanent transfer. That would be perfect to have their money back after what they spent to sign Jadon Sancho from, from Borussia Dortmund. But at the moment, they know that in the January transfer window to find a top club in Europe prepared to pay maybe that's my opinion, not the official price. Something in the region of 50, 55 million pounds is not going to be easy. So we have to see what happens there in terms of formula of the deal. And in terms of updates, at the moment, absolutely no change. There is no apologize from Jadon Sancho. Uh, at the moment, the feeling of people at Manchester United is very clear. Uh, it looks like it's 90% over between Jadon Sancho and Man United. We keep a 10% because everything can happen in football. But as of today, it reminds of the situation of, of Cristiano Ronaldo one year ago. Uh, the situation is really complicated and for Manchester United and for Eric Ten Hag himself when the situation is tense he doesn't want to have any problem internally at the club and that's why the feeling is that Jadon Sancho has to find a new solution on the January transfer win. Fabrizio, Calvin Phillips isn't getting the game time that he craves at Manchester City. There's a Euros coming up this summer. Will he stay or go in January? I see him leaving. Uh, at the moment, it's not 100% decided yet, but the feeling I have speaking to some sources is that it's very, very likely uh, for Calvin Phillips to, live, to leave in the January uh, transfer window. That's, that's the idea, that's the feeling, because the player in public, but also in private, being very honest uh, with people close to him, is always telling that he wants to play. He wants to be a regular starter. He wanted to try this new opportunity at Manchester City in this first part of the season, because in the summer he had some opportunity to go, uh, maybe on permanent transfer or on loan, but the player always said that he wanted to stay at Manchester City to fight for his place. But now we are at the end of October, he's almost never playing. And also for the Euros, for Calvin Phillips, it's always important to be on the pitch and to have the opportunity to, to develop. So he's being super professional. That's why Manchester City are very happy with his, with his approach, with his mentality. But at the same time, they know that in case they receive proposals for the general transfer window, it's going to be very likely for, uh, for Calvin to leave. So at the moment, it's not something that they decided in a direct meeting, but both sides, player and club, uh, see this situation in the same way with the likely exit in the, in the January window. 
Uh, and what about um, Victor Ossiman? Uh, is there any truth to the rumour that Liverpool have made contact with him? Now, the moment we had these rumours coming from, from Italy and specifically from people close to Napoli that he has an agreement with Liverpool, I was asking and I can guarantee 100% that Victor Osiman has not agreed anything with any club and is also not negotiating any contract or any salary with any other club. So this is not the moment. Uh, Osiman and people close to him are are absolutely aware of the interests of many clubs around Europe. It's normal when a player is out of country in summer 25. It's absolutely normal to see the interest of Chelsea and many other clubs around Europe. But at the moment, there is no, no negotiation at all. Uh, they are not discussing any salary. So these reports are being denied by people close to, to Victor Osiman. But what is also true is that Osiman has not agreed any new deal at Napoli. And that's an important news because in August, the proposal from Napoli was an important one, the biggest salary in the history of Napoli. So they proposed a very important contract to, to Victor Osiman. In August, they were very confident to get the new deal done. But then in September and now in October, the agreement with the player is still far from being done. And from what I'm told at the moment, the negotiations are, are not advancing, are not progressing, are still on standby. That's why the situation looks dangerous for Napoli. He's out of country in summer 25. And so if, he, if they can't agree a new deal in the next months, I think next summer for Osiman is going to be probably time to leave. And what about uh, Ivan Tony, another striker um, people are looking at? Is there anything new on, on his situation? Well, there is a lot of interest. Uh, since he joined the Stellar Agency in the summer, it was uh, August when he decided to move with, uh, with Stellar Agency. The idea of the player is to move to an English top club. There was interest from many clubs already last year, uh, especially from Italy also. Some important club wanted to consider that opportunity to go and sign Ivan Toni, but now joining Stellar Group, it means that for the player, the priority is to stay in England, to stay in Premier League and join a top Premier League club. At the moment, there is still no negotiation with Brentford, so we are at very early stages. I would say that we are at the interest stage for, uh, for the Ivan Toni deal. There is interest from Arsenal, for sure. He's a player appreciated by people at the club, uh, so they consider Toni as an important striker. But we have to see uh, if Arsenal want to spend big amount of money again after what they did in the summer with many players, obviously like Rice, Havertz and all the others, if they want to spend big money again in the January window on a striker like, like Ivan Toni. Same for Chelsea. Uh, we mentioned them for Victor Osiman, but Ivan Toni is another striker that they are uh, following and monitoring because they will go for a striker in 2024. Let's see if it's going to be January or summer, but the idea to go for a striker is still there since last summer. And so I think Tony is still a player appreciated by Chelsea. We have to see what Tottenham want to do. At the moment, they are very happy with the performance of the squad. But in case they will go for a striker, Tony could be an opportunity for many clubs, I think, around Europe. But the priority of the player is to stay in England. And for Brentford, the price tag has to be something around £65 million, not less than £65 million. They want more than this, but the feeling of sources is that around £65 million, the deal could be, could be done. Fabrizio, we spoke about Calvin Phillips potentially leaving to boost his England chances. What about Aaron Ramsdale? It seems clear that David Raya is the number one at Arsenal. There's bound to be interest in Ramsdale. Any chance of a January exit? I would keep that open, but at the moment I'm not aware of any negotiation. Also because the goalkeeper's market is different. For a midfielder, is it's pretty easy to leave in the January window because you always can find an opportunity around Europe for goalkeepers to leave and have a guaranteed spot in an important club is not that easy. Uh, if you look at all the top clubs around Europe, almost everywhere they have a goalkeeper and they have an important goalkeeper there. So it's not easy to go uh, spend big money on Aaron Ramsdale and move on the January transfer window. Usually the goalkeepers always move in the summer window and when there is a domino of goalkeepers. So that's why at the moment there is still nothing concrete, still nothing close. From what I'm hearing, Arsenal are not negotiating with any club. They still hope Ramsdale will accept to compete with David Raya till the end of the season and then make a decision in the summer transfer window when they understand that the situation could be different. But at the moment, I would still keep it open because we never know. Uh, we know that uh, with injuries or this kind of things, uh, things can move really uh, fast, as we saw with Kepa Real Madrid, for example, when, when Thibaut Courtois was, was injured. So we have to keep it open. But at the moment, there is still no, no negotiation or nothing concrete. That's for Britia for us. Um, as ever, with us every week, I do keep your questions coming in. One thing I didn't ask him, uh, only because I wanted to ask you, JJ, uh, exactly what the latest was with Kylian Mbappe at PSG. 
Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a funny old time for for Kylian Mbappe in PSG. Uh, just over the weekend, he scored and got an assist against Strasbourg. So that actually brought an end to what was uh, a goal drought of a calendar month for Mbappe at club level, which is uh, you know quite unlike him. Uh, but obviously, over the international break, we saw him in fine form with France scoring twice against the Netherlands to qualify Le Bleu for um, Euro 2024. Also scored against Scotland in that friendly as well. So he's certainly coming back into form at an important moment moment uh, in the season for PSG. Uh, obviously, they've got that big and important double header in the Champions League against Milan coming up, uh, you know, but they're also not top of Ligue 1 still, and they've got uh, a big clash uh, with league leaders, Monaco looming towards the end of November, to, to bear in mind, obviously, Mbappe's former club as well. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's been a tough start to the season, and I think form-wise, you're certainly seeing the impact of Mbappe having had not much of a pre-season uh, in the fact that fitness-wise, he's struggling perhaps a bit more than he would have done in previous seasons. But uh, equally, with everything that's sort of coming up for him and, and, you know, for the French national team, not only with the Euros, but also with the Olympic Games as well in Paris next summer, perhaps that's not such a bad thing because that is, uh, you know, hugely important to him and PSG have known this for, for a couple of years. But in terms of sort of potentially a breakthrough regarding his future, uh, you know, a, a, a potential contract extension or him moving on, there's not really been any sort of major progress uh, as far as I'm aware in terms of him. Uh, you know, being ready to pledge his future to the club uh, or being ready to, you know, to, to agree to a move elsewhere. It sounds like a lot will depend on how PSG fare in the Champions League this season. There is a bit of optimism sort of around the squad at the moment with the ideas that Luis Enrique is putting into place with the fact that there's this new French core uh, being redeveloped, uh, you know, not just with some of the players that came in this summer, the likes of Colo Mouani, Barcola, uh, Hernandez, um, you know, you've also got the likes of Warren Zaya Emery, who's really now becoming uh, an integral figure for PSG under Luis Enrique. But, you know, there's this idea that PSG are now just sort of more than the the big star names that they used to be when they had the likes of Neymar, when they had the likes of Messi. Uh, and obviously there's a, another important factor at play when you're talking about Mbappe as well, and that's the the commercial future of, uh, of Ligue 1 and French football to which Mbappe is absolutely vital uh, and it's coming at a very tricky moment where Ligue 1 and the LFP are trying to negotiate uh, you know new TV deals both domestically and internationally so there is a lot at play and a lot in the air but a, a huge amount of influence I think we can attribute to how PSG fare in the Champions League and we won't know the result of that until probably at least uh, you know sort of springtime when we know that PSG generally tend to deliver some of their most underwhelming performances in Europe. So there'll be <laughs> yeah. no, uh, <laughs> there, there, there won't there won't be much tolerance for another repeat of that uh, performance that we saw in Newcastle a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, uh, let's move slightly nearer to home. Um, and, and Everton would love to think about European football. They can't, they can't at the moment, Ben, but give us the latest on the, on the takeover and um, potentially a, a collapse in the 777 takeover or clearly some difficulty in this takeover? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say collapse at the moment, but 77 partners have been unable to smoothly complete, which was the belief at least a few weeks ago. And the reason for that is because it's understood that the American-based company have missed a deadline set by the Financial Conduct Authority to provide up-to-date financial records. And without the correct financial information being passed on, it becomes less clear where the money is coming from, which could prevent any form of approval as far as the Premier League is concerned. So you then get a bit of an impasse. Now, I should point out that despite reports of collapse, despite reports of missed deadlines, which on the Financial Conduct Authority side, I was also able to stand up. 777 partners have pretty much rubbished any suggestions that they've fallen behind and that they're not going to be able to complete the deal. So where we were previously was that 77 partners had agreed a 550 million deal to buy Everton. And that's also highly significant because Everton are currently under a financial fair play breaches investigation. And we may actually get more on that and a potential punishment very soon. They're also in the process of building a new stadium that will be part of Euro 2028 at Bramley Moor Dock. It's known as the Everton Stadium. So all of that 
is contingent on new investment in order to keep the club going. If they get points docked, if they have FFP breaches, they might end up opening up a new stadium in the championship and not being financially healthy. And this is why the deal is essential that it has to go through, but it can't unless 7-7 partners show their proof of funds and the process and all of the regulatory elements are transparent. So again, there's two sides here. The FCA speak as if a deadline was missed. 777 partners counter saying that all relevant documentation was passed on and that the process is on track. So I don't think we can say collapse yet, but what we can say is that there are hitches to the process, which I still think will eventually get done, but it's a little bit more in doubt than it was a few weeks ago. JJ, you you know a little bit about this group. Yeah, it's um, I mean, seven 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 are are fascinating. They have been for the last couple of years because obviously their rise to to sort of prominence and and having a, a say in a number of European clubs has been, uh, you know, sort of very overnight um, in in how it's come through. But I'd say one thing that has sort of emerged uh, as sort of a, a recurring. Uh, theme in all of that is how a lot of the time the the deals which sort of put them into power in the first place often get forced through for example speaking sort of uh, you know solely sort of in my own backyard with uh, in France they've got Red Star who are currently top of the the semi-professional third tier five points clear with the game in hand so things look good for them finally to move back up to the the fully professional second tier but that deal itself uh, you know got forced through in the face of you know quite significant fan opposition uh, you know, and since then, uh, you know, it's been very well documented that there are big question marks, not only over 777's finances, but also just the way that they handle the clubs and run these clubs. Uh, you know, we've seen them add, uh, you know, other names to their stable since the likes of Hertha Berlin, who find themselves struggling now in uh, in the second tier in Germany as well. So, you know, it is, it's baffling in many ways that they're, you know, linked with such a problematic Premier League club, uh, you know, that would take a lot to turn around, not just in terms of sort of financial resources, but sort of in terms of the, the expertise, the project, the kind of vision that would be needed, uh, you know, to, to keep, not, not just to put Everton uh, in a better place than they are now, but actually just to sort of keep them from falling out of the Premier League, because regardless of who's owning the club at that time, if they were to fall out of the division this season, it could be potentially catastrophic for the club. So it's certainly, I, I wouldn't say that they've covered themselves in glory in, uh, in France so far, but it, there is a feeling generally sort of across Europe in some of these countries where they do have interests like Belgium with Standard Liège, for example, that there hasn't been sort of enough of a track record established to really feel truly optimistic that they could turn around a club that's in as much turmoil as Everton has been the last few years. Um, I, I just want to get through a couple of questions before uh, we have to go. And one of them is on Andre Santos, um, an intriguing um question it was uh, but uh, basically this is this is a generic one your thoughts on andre santos plans where does he where does he ben your your put your chelsea hat on because you've got uh, good insider knowledge of of chelsea and what's going on there what are the plans that chelsea have for andre santos yeah, I think it's more about putting a Nottingham Forest hat on and a Steve Cooper hat on because Andre Santos has gone on loan to Nottingham Forest and he's not really playing. And as a consequence, the loan has no benefits to Chelsea. So I think that this will be assessed in January. Nottingham Forest have got a big squad. They've made a relatively positive start to the season. And within the season-long loan that Andre Santos has at Nottingham Forest, there is a break clause in January in addition to to that, there are some financial penalties from Nottingham Forest's perspective if Andre Santos, when fit, is not playing regularly. And that's quite interesting because Chelsea can't tell Nottingham Forest who to pick. Santos could be fit and just below the standard or not the fit for the tactics that Forest are looking for. But generally, if he's excluded throughout this loan period, then there will be penalties of sorts to Nottingham Forest. Now, I don't think that is Steve Cooper hasn't picked the player, so Nottingham Forest have some kind of Santos fine because that would be relatively 
ridiculous. I think it will be more about the original finances that have been agreed between Chelsea and Forrest. And the less games he plays, ultimately Nottingham Forrest will be in a position where it becomes either more expensive to them or alternatively Chelsea have means of benefiting and that may allow for this to drag on for the full season if it's headed in in a positive direction because there is some kind of incentive for Forrest to be playing Santos but we may be in a position where Chelsea just decide to draw a line under it in January because they can find a better fit whether that's in their squad or whether that's elsewhere. I think the latter is more likely because as everyone gets fit for Chelsea and if they gather momentum, it may be harder for Santos to return mid-season and break into the Chelsea fold. So then he still wouldn't be getting that many minutes. So I think the option number one will be that he gets up to speed at Forest. And if he stays fit, then it's a season-long loan and he plays more and Forrest will effectively be penalised of sorts if he doesn't. Or option number two is that Chelsea realise that the loan hasn't worked out and because Santos isn't playing, they'll bring him back in January and they'll loan him out somewhere else. And there's plenty of interest in Santos. So if Chelsea do bring Santos back, they won't be short of suitors for another January loan. Well, he's only 19, isn't he? Um, I think. Um, JJ, uh, Strasbourg, is that an option? For Santos, have they have they looked into him? I mean, I think you'd have to to give it serious uh, consideration. Obviously, the links between uh, Chelsea's ownership group, Bluco, uh, and Strasbourg are there. Uh, you can look at what's happening with Strasbourg on the pitch at the moment. Started the season very encouragingly, but their form's dropped off a little bit of late. Uh, they do currently uh, already have Angelo on loan there as well, uh, who's faring very well, despite it being quite a mixed start for Patrick Vieira. So I do think that's an option that could potentially be looked into uh, sort of midway through the season. But that's a assuming that, you know, going back to Ben's point, that the decision is made, uh, you know, to potentially bring him back uh, from Forest and, and look to recast him somewhere else. Uh, you know, I do think sort of looking at having seen them uh, in action over the weekend against PSG, uh, you know, they definitely benefit from somebody of his uh, of his talent, of his ability, uh, if he was available to them. But obviously that decision would have to be made, uh, you know, closer to the end of the year in the January transfer window. Okay, good stuff. It'll be interesting to see how Patrick Vieira does get on there, actually. Um, well, Ben, there was there was a lovely comment we had earlier on. Uh, I think it was Aravinda who was singing your praise. Oh, thanks a lot, Ben, for clearing <laughs> and explaining in detail about things which are all going on. And thank you, Court Offside, for this amazing job, what you guys done. Uh, ben, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, it's easy to be a fan words. when you offer people backhanders before the show to write nice <laughs> things about you, though, isn't it? <laughs> Good old Aravinda. Um, yeah, your mate. Uh, anyway, it was lovely to hear from you, Aravinda. And um, uh, Ben is here every week on The Debrief, trying to keep you up to date with everything that is going on, not only in England, but also in uh, Saudi and with JJ here with uh, in France. And we've had the US link as well before. So we do try and keep across as much of world football as we can on the debrief. I think at that stage, we have probably done enough, gents, and uh, answered as many questions as we can. We've also had Fabrizio Romano. So my thanks to uh, Jonathan Johnson for joining us uh, again. Or any time you are welcome, JJ, to come back on the debrief. Oh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, always a pleasure to be on and yeah, very much looking forward to the to the next appearance and hopefully we can set aside some time to sink our teeth into Leon and the uh, the mess that's unfolding for John Textor there. Well, absolutely. It was something we did want to get onto today and uh, I keep your powder dry because uh, I think we will revisit that in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, ben, thank you very much indeed um, for all your knowledge too. And thanks everyone for listening, for watching. We're back again next week with The Debrief. From us all, bye-bye.